from my viewpoint, a lot of the political fallout that came after the accident at Centennial Airport and that resulted in a review by the FAA of the airplane once again. There were two accidents that happened at Centennial Airport and they were fairly close to one another. One, uh, the latter one, was a controlled flight into terrain accident. Fairly simple. The airplane hit the ground flat level, short of the runway, out in the hills to the south of Centennial Airport. The first one had an engine shut down for reasons that as of yet have been undetermined. And the pilot made a fairly steep angle bank to try to get back to the runway, installed the aircraft, and spun into the ground. That got the attention of uh, political forces in the Denver area that then caused uh, quite a ruckus in, in Washington, D.C. with the FAA. And the FAA conducted a flight standards board on the MU-2. I was involved in the flight standards board and its purpose was to try and identify what common factors there might be in accidents that have happened with this airplane. The results of the flight standards board were, and I think everybody agreed prior to that, that training and standardization of checklists and standardization of training programs was really the culprit here. Early on, the FAA asked the owners and operators through a letter to please respond to them to tell them what was wrong with the MU-2. And inside of three weeks, they received 175 responses, approximately, every one of which said that the real problem with the MU-2 was that people weren't trained or training properly in the aircraft. There were several different types of training programs, several different versions of checklists and interpretations of the flight manual that were causing a condition of flying the airplane that had a very wide spectrum of operational parameters. Cirrus Design's Vision SJ50 single-engine personal jet offers exceptional fuel efficiency, flexible seating for up to seven, advanced avionics, and all the Cirrus safety features you expect, including the Cirrus airframe parachute system. With its detailed design, the Cirrus Vision is technologically advanced, yet engineered to be simple to fly, to allow owner pilots more lifestyle pursuits than any other personal aircraft. Learn more about the Vision SJ50 at CirrusDesign.com. The FAA's assessment was that there should be one standardized training program, there should be one standardized checklist, and that the AFM should be updated. Now all of those things have happened. A special FAR has been issued to require training and to require the operation of the aircraft to be in conformity with the training program, the checklist, and the flight manual. And those things will largely solve the problem of non-standardization in our system. An interesting phenomenon that's happened to the MU-2 and its, and its pilots and its owners has been that every single person that we've ever talked to has been in favor of the SFAR. Now that's not common to the system today. If you tried to enact an SFAR on a King Air or, or another aircraft, um, you would get a lot of resistance. The MU-2 community is a very tight-knit community. And when it became evident that we were once again being scrutinized by the FAA or that the MU-2 was being scrutinized once again by the FAA, our owners and operators rallied around Mitsubishi, rallied around the FAA. And when they were asked and their opinions were made known, it became evident that they were aware of the problem and that their, their fix to the problem was to have mandatory training for the aircraft. So in the implementation of the SFAR, which carries with it the weight of several different uh, points that are made within the SFAR, with the, with the implementation of the SFAR, we're going to enter a, a new age with the airplane. That new age is going to cause pilots to be scrutinized to an extent necessary to make sure that they comply with commercial instrument procedures and that they meet the commercial instrument standards that are published by the FAA in the practical test standards. Now, the practical test standards are what you complied with when you first got your certificate. So you must still stay or you must remain at the level of proficiency of the commercial and instrument multi-engine land in order to continue to fly the airplane. And that's the, the basis upon which the training program was created. Okay, we are cleared for our approach. Have our Garmin GPS set up to fly the LPV. And look, here comes the glide path. And you're probably wondering how we can intercept a glide path when there's no ILS on the field. 
Well, hey, that's the beauty of WASP GPS. No ILS, no localizer, no problem. WASP gives us full vertical guidance even without ground-based navbay. Okay, next you're probably wondering why there's spit all over your side of the windshield. The airplane's personality changed um, along with the people flying it as well. As pilots became more attuned to turboprops and became more attuned to flying at 300 knots, we began to get a better quality of pilot. We also began to get a pilot who was willing to go to training and wanted to go to training. And I think that the personality of the airplane changes along with that. Now, as you know, the airplane's kind of had a bad rap. You can just talk to almost any pilot on the ramp who will tell you some story about the airplane that he heard from somebody who heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody. <clears throat> and about 99% of the time, when you overhear a conversation like that, it becomes pretty evident that they've never been anywhere near an MU-2. In some cases, we've had an opportunity to take those people up for a ride in the airplane. Let them fly the aircraft. Offer them the Pepsi challenge, so to speak. Um, if they think there's something wrong with the airplane, let's go fly it. And you show me what you think you know about the aircraft, and we'll let you fly it. In demonstrating this airplane to people, some who love the airplane and others who have had misgivings about it, I've never had an occasion where a person getting out of the airplane didn't turn around and look back at the airplane and say, gosh, what a great machine that is. Uh, never had anybody get out of the airplane and say, well, that was an experience. I, I didn't like it at all. As a pilot, you learn to appreciate the finer things in aviation, and I think that the MU-2 is one of the finer things in aviation. So I think it's, it's an airplane that, um, that has made its own personality. Um, it had a reputation, and I think actually that reputation is turning to the good. I think more and more people are beginning to see the value of this aircraft. Its bang for the buck, I think, equals anything that there is in the industry out there today. I think the future of the MU-2 is, is, is excellent. Uh, I think that over a period of time, we'll see the hull values come back up. We'll see that an aircraft right now that's a little in flux um, with the issuance of the SFAR will eventually stabilize. Uh, I think that the aircraft shows its value when it's purchased and upgraded by its, by its new owner. And we, we see that all the time. And where Mitsubishi originally thought that we would by now have seen many fewer airframes in the system, have now realized that uh, this aircraft is going to remain stable for another 15 to 25 years. And I believe Mitsubishi is going to continue to support the airplane for that period of time.